Um, I'm not sure about no-till royalty. We, we, we do a lot of social media, so I guess our names are out there, which is great. But thank you, Paul and John and Alex, for giving me this opportunity to come and talk to you and tell you a little bit about what we're doing at Overbury with our no-till work. Um, it's a fantastic opportunity, and I didn't hesitate to say yes to accept the, the, uh, the invitation, so it's absolutely fantastic. So we're going to go through, we're going to have a bit of an intro into the farm. I want to tell you a little bit about um, why no-till, what, what got me started on it, and then we're going to carry on through what we are currently doing at Overbury. Um, and that's looking at four main areas of no-till, of cover cropping, rotations, and then finally, livestock. How can we look after our livestock, both above ground and below ground, and what we're actually trying to do to enhance that environment for them as well? And um, this, is, this is where we start, really. Um, a quote from Nelson Mandela. He just said uh, one time, it always seems impossible until it's done. And that's something that I think, as no-tillers, we seem to uh, come up across that, that wall um, from a lot of different areas of our industry. And it is all perfectly possible to crack on and do what we're doing. We're quite a mixed farm. We're 1,000 feet above sea level on very thin Cotswold brash down to 100 foot above sea level on Lias clay. Somebody once told me that my farm that I manage is trying to be a building site. Um, we have got bricks at the bottom and we've got a patio at the top. And actually in the middle we've got sand and gravel trying to be the cement. And that's actually what it's trying to do. So it's really mixed farm, very, very variable. We're a leaf demonstration farm and we try to grow crops that have premiums and that have a story behind them. So our wheat goes into Kellogg's, our oilseed rate goes to ADM, our malting barley goes to Molston Cores, we're part of their growers group. And as long as they can supply enough CO2, um, hopefully those sales will continue to keep pressing on. Uh, we are mixed, we've got grass, we've got 300 hectares of grassland, 1,200 ewes running around on those. We've got an HLS um, operation and also we've got a shoot and some forestry as well. So it is really mixed and it's diversity as well, which is absolutely key in terms of running this sort of operation going further forward. Um, we have been a leaf demonstration farm since 2012 and leaf linking environment and farming who are here today, which is great and yesterday, um, it's a fantastic organisation, really, really passionate about sustainability. And it's a very overused word, but actually it's what we're all about. It's how can we continue to farm in the next 300 years. Overbury's been in the same family since 1722, and we're looking at the next 300 years in front of us. So there's a lot going on. We do a lot of our social media, as I say. We open for Open Farm Sunday. We hold, host leaf um, lambing days, and we get probably 1,200, 1,500 people around the farm every year. And to have that opportunity to engage with our customers is also something that I feel very, very passionate about what we need to do. So we're using modern technology along with traditional methods. And I think that's this sort of um, symbiosis that no-till and the associated uh, benefits of that um, can all play a role. So what got me started? Uh, I did a Nuffield Farming Scholarship in 2013, and I was in Oklahoma, and they all say that you'll get a light bulb moment when you're doing some sort of study like that. Mine was standing in the middle of the desert growing crops of wheat. And on one side of the road uh, was a soil that had been managed in no-till for 20 years. And that soil was um, full of life. It was full of organic matter. It had a heart to it. And the other side of the road, after two inches of rain, was completely dry. It was fractionless. And you can see it on the right-hand side there. That soil was dead. And to me, that was the key to make a transitional change at home and um, managed to do that with the support of um, Penelope, who's here today, to um, undertake this switch um, into setting up a no-till farming system. We don't do it across all of our land because we do let some land out for field-scale vegetables. Um, that rotates around 40 hectares a year out of 1,200. Um, but the majority of the farm, the Cotswold Brash, the Lias Clay, and a chunk of the sand and gravel land has all been down into no-till. Some of it since 2013 when we started trialling and then we bought our own drill in 2015 and um, the story sort of continues from there. And this is what we're trying to achieve. This is, this is to me, the panacea of what we're trying to do. We're keep, trying to keep our soils covered. We're trying to keep them alive. No-till gives us lots of opportunities to do that. From an economical point of view, it gives us a lot of cost savings. 
Our combinable crop establishment is costing us now about £52 a hectare to get these crops established. That's down significantly from where we were before, and I'll come on to that in a minute. We're getting our fuel use per hectare down from 52 litres a hectare in a conventional system where we were top downing, carriering, horse drilling, rolling, from 52 litres a hectare down to about 13. So that's some huge savings, both to the pocket and also to the environment as well. And that's before you start looking at the soil health, the reduced soil erosion, the improved water quality, the improved air quality, the improved environment for our pollen and nectar species um, and the general farmland birds. Over these 900 hectares, we're saving 35,000 litres of fuel a year. That's 17 grand a year. Um, it equates to 31 and a half tonnes of saved carbon dioxide CO2 emissions. And that's before you start looking at the nitrous oxides being released from the soil through cultivations. So we're making some huge significant savings, which is important. 80% of the cultivations, 80% uh, of the soil damage through cultivations is compaction. And we're trying to alleviate that by using this sort of technique. We're doing some work at the moment with Gloucestershire University and we've got a PhD student, Camilla, who has been doing some water infiltration tests with us. Um, and on our heavy land, we are now up to about 24 millimetres an hour worth of water infiltration. And on our Cotswold Brash, which is very free draining anyway, we're up over 120 millimetres per hour of rainfall. So it's significant environmental benefits as well. Our soil organic matters on our sand and gravel land, so our real light land, have gone from about 1.1% um, organic matter up to 2.2 in 10 years, which is quite significant, and that's before we've actually shifted into our no-till system. That was just through uh, minimal cultivations and soil amendments, which we'll come on to in a bit. And I can see that increase in um, organic matter inclusion rates in the soil actually starting to, to leap upwards with our, with our switch into no-till. It does come with a few challenges though. Slugs are one of the main ones, um, and also patients, and this year has certainly been one of them. This is some of the costings that we looked at when we were um, first setting out on the, on the view to no-till. Um, in terms of, a, this was a plough-based, min-till, one pass, and then a no-till scenario. If you multiply that over, up over the areas, then um, it, it results in some significant kind of annual ongoing savings. But it's just a lot more than just that annual cost as well. There's the capital element of it. So over 10 years, we'll save £270,000 worth of capital that we're not reinvesting in new tractors, not reinvesting in new top downs, new subsoilers, and things like that. Our horsepower has gone from 620 hectares down to 620 horsepower down to 370. So we're using about 60% less equipment that's not being insured, that's not being maintained, that's not being filled up with fuel every day. So there are some huge savings. But one of the, ones, the interesting ones for me is this one. So in our old system, it was taking us 56 minutes a hectare to establish a crop. Um, so of your hour that you're working, your free time is only 7%. You get four minutes off every hour for every hectare. When you start switching into no-till, we're doing it in a quarter of an hour to establish a crop in terms of the time. So that gives you... Um, quite a lot of extra time for other activities. What, what those other activities may be, that's entirely up to you. But you do have a lot more time. So you could go and look at opportunities for collaboration with neighbours. You could have the weekend off and go to the beach. Entirely up to you. But those savings are significant and, and ones not to really be sniffed at. Um, No-till doesn't work without cover crops. It's a bit like hand-in-hand uh, -hand marriage, really. These things work together, and they have to. We have to keep the soil alive. We have to keep it covered. So for me, five minutes is a fallow. If it's, it's a bit staged. Um, but if, you're, if you can get your cover crops established within 24 hours um, of the combine going through, there's usually still enough moisture there. This year might be challenging. Um, you've also got the soil at its warmest and the days are at its longest. So you've got great opportunity to grow a decent amount of dry matter. Um, we've measured up to five tonnes a hectare of cover crop dry matter from an early August planting of cover crops versus two tonnes a hectare of dry matter from a late August, beginning of September. And actually, if you're talking about value for money, value for your seeds, 
then that early drilling and this organisation and the strategy of being able to do this all at the same time is absolutely important. This year we're trying to jump the gun a little bit and we're spinning some cover crop seeds in before we actually combine. Um, we used to do it years ago with stubble turnips, went away from that because emergence was slightly patchy. But where we're combining later up on the hill and we're drilling earlier, the window is almost too small for cover crops. So can we jump that system forward um, by getting crops established and sort of, sort of by cropping them really? And diversity is the key for me when we're talking about cover crops. How can we uh, put lots of different rooting zones, different rooting characteristics, um, some compaction removal, some nitrogen fixing, some nitrogen scavenging? Um, how can we put all that into a concoction that will actually benefit our soil? So the cover crops, as well as giving the no-till option something to work on, we're keeping the soil covered. We're keeping it a coat of armour across it, great American term, soil armour. And that's really, really important. I did some temperature measurements this, this, uh, earlier this season, and there was a 16 degree difference in soil temperature from bare land and land under cover crops. And that's really, really important because you're keeping that soil cooler, you're losing less moisture, and that's keeping the biology in that top area where the root zones are gonna be, that's keeping that more active and more alive. And to me, that's really, really important. The arm is also keeping that soil in place as well. Annually, we're using to, losing 2.2 million tonnes of arable land um, through soil erosion. And keeping that soil covered, keeping those roots, binding all that topsoil together, for me, is absolutely key. We farm on a slope, all facing downhill. We don't get any erosion from our fields now. We used to, but we don't anymore. And that, to me, is a significant um, benefit, a significant public good, if you like. Somebody's said that once before. Um, and that is a, is a way that farmers can actually stand out and say, yeah, actually, we are delivering on the environment by not letting our soils run down the road. But actually, that's important for the business as well. So we're increasing soil health. We're providing worm foods. Those of you that have seen Jackie here yesterday, um, you know, worms are absolutely key to what we're trying to do. We are worm farmers. Um, cover crops can help that. Yields are also increasing after cover crops, mostly. It doesn't work all the time, but some work with Kellogg's and NIAB um, we're indicating a 0.3 to 0.5 tonnes a hectare yield, leaf, yield, yield lift in oats after cover crops. That's all organic matter. We're growing organic matter. We're capturing carbon and putting that into the soil and locking it away in the bank. We're getting better rainfall infra, infra, infiltration. We're actually able to help control weeds as well in, with this sort of technique. And one of the things that really surprised me and one of the benefits that I hadn't really thought of at all was the fact that we are having flowers pollinate, uh, being able to pollinate and provide food for our insects way, way, way back into the back half of the year. So into November, we're still having bees floating around the farm. And to me, that was like an uncalculated benefit. You know, you can't say that's worth five pounds a hectare, or maybe Mr. Gove should actually be saying that's worth 50 pounds a hectare. Um, but that to me was from a holistic um, point of view of looking at whole farm dynamics, that was really, really important. And also they're reducing compaction, which is also absolutely key to what we're trying to do. And then there's rotation. So we can't grow wheat, wheat, oilseed, rape anymore. I don't want to, I never really have. Um, so we're trying to add more and more diversity into what we're growing. So we've been combining some peas, uh, we've tried soya beans, we've tried linseed, um, spring barley, we've got some um, spring oats this year some wheat, it's trying to create diversity, different roots, rooting zones. We're trying to keep pulses in the rotation um, for enhancing the soil biology and the mycorrhizal fungi interactions. Um, and these are all really, really important. Um, it's also helping us with our resistance potential as well, trying not to rely on the same types of chemistry each time that we're actually using these things. And then ultimately, we're going on to livestock as well. What can we do with our sheep within our rotation? And it's great that livestock um, appeared in the, uh, in the groundswell program um, because it is really integral in terms of that mixed grazing approach, whether that's mob grazing of cattle or, or our sheep in our case. Um, and this is going back to that sort of uh, mixed farming scenario, which I think a lot of us are trying to get back to, that, that golden hoof, that organic matter that's being recycled through those animals onto the, onto the fields. So they're recycling the organic matter Slug control as well, if you can stop them densely enough. 
Um, we're aiming to graze about 50% of our cover crops, leaving the other 50% for the soil, for the, for the, um, the soil and the worms and the, the biology in there, um, giving us an increased opportunity to uh, rest our grassland. We're all permanent pasture, um, but if we can take the sheep off those and keep them on the cover crops through the winter, that gives us a better uh, wedge of grass to turn out onto when we've got lambs at foot. Um, so that grazing season is being extended. Uh, that's reducing our winter housing period, and that's obviously saving us time, saving us money, and saving us energy. There are a few limits in terms of fencing and water, but nothing that we can't kind of get around and, uh, and manage. As I said before, it's not just about the livestock above ground, it's also about the livestock below ground as well. So we're retaining as much straw as we possibly can. Uh, we do sell a little bit of barley straw in front of oilseed rape to try and remove that habitat for slugs, and that's being replaced by compost. Um, so we're buying poultry litter in, we've got a stud on the farm, so basically a horse wheeze on a stable full of straw and it gets taken out, so it's kind of like it's just straight straw. Loads of carbon, so matching that with the uh, high nitrogen poultry litter. Uh, we're putting that through um, a interrogator, aerating that, spreading that, making it into compost. Uh, we've got a straw for muck deal on another neighbouring farm for 500 tonnes of cattle muck. Um, we get 400 tonnes of mushroom compost in, our sheep muck that we're, uh, that we're spreading out as well, and we're also looking at biosolids in the future. So we're trying to get to about 3,000 tonnes of organic matter going back um, onto the farm every year, um, which is quite an ask in terms of how we, how we manage that from an environmental point of view. But actually that annual or biannual dressing of compost, so it's organic matter, it's nutrients, but it's also biology, um, is really, really important. But we're looking at a whole load of other things as well. So this is one of the things that we're looking at, companion cropping. I know there's quite a few guys in the audience that are doing this as well. Um, so can we companion crop our oilseed rape uh, with buckwheat and vetches um, to try and fix nitrogen, to shade uh, weeds, and also to act as a deterrent from cabbage stem flea beetle? Last three years, it's worked really, really well with no insecticides being applied. Um, we're also growing uh, free organic matter as well at the same time. And this is what it looks like a bit later on in the year. Like you go out there in November and you think, crikey, the rape's never going to survive. Um, it's going to get swamped out and it's going to die. Quick frost takes out the buckwheat. A um, bit of astro curb takes out uh, black grass, any grass weeds, um, and also then takes the vetches out. So you're coming into the spring uh, with an, uh, an oilseed rape crop that looks very, very healthy. And we're also able to cut down our nitrogen um, in uh, in in terms of total amount as well that we applied. Obviously there's a few costs involved, a bit of extra seed, but there's some huge savings to be had as well. So uh, no pre-em herbicide, reduced nitrogen fertilizer, no insecticides, net benefit 35 pounds a hectare before you look at uh, any kind of yield increase. We did some over the Weybridge split fields last year, um, saw no detriment in yield, um, no uplift either, but we're getting the cost savings in there as well. And actually there's a whole load of savings that you can't actually quantify in terms of mycorrhizal hosting, which brassicas don't do, um, compaction removal, nitrogen fixing, you know, this whole spectrum of the under the soil population that we're trying to improve and grow. We're looking at some other things as well. So we're under sowing barley. Uh, this is a bit of a rotational, a bit opportunistic, opportunistic um, where we know we've got oilseed rape coming into the rotation and we've got a lot of pheasants kicking around in the woods. Um, the rape gets hammered, so we're under a couple of two years' worth of grass lays um, with red clover, perennial ryegrass, uh, plantain and chicory um, for the sheep to grow, graze. Um, and then also we're under sowing some clover. This is white clover, under sowed with kale. Um, again, trying to mix that, that diet up for the livestock, fixing nitrogen, uh, matting the soil together so the compaction from the sheep um, is, is trying to be minimalised as, uh, as best as it can be. And I saw this the other day, just finally to finish up on, and I think this is really, really important, and I think it sums up the, the idea of uh, this sort of conference. Um, Steve Goff on Twitter has also said that improved soil health is a journey and not a destination. And I think that's also key. We get hung up on these sorts of targets, and we try to get there. But this is a little bit fluid. There is no recipe book for what we're trying to do. We're learning as we go. Um, and I think this sort of forum is fantastic to be able to share ideas, swap um, thoughts and mistakes, and um, hopefully we can, uh, we can continue to learn and move forward. Um, and with that, 
Thank you very much indeed for listening. Good morning. Um, right, so uh, there's an awful lot of similarities really between what we've been doing and, and what Jake's just spoken about. So really, rather than kind of tell you a lot of the same things twice in a row, which uh, gets a bit repetitive, um, I'll give you more of a quick overview of really why, we, why I kind of came to, to, to start No-Till kind of uh, ten, nine, ten years ago now. And, uh, and maybe some of the problems we've had along the way. And then really, I think perhaps if you want to ask any questions or whatever, that's probably better and you can kind of lead which way things want to go. Um, so um, my name's Clive Bailey and um, I'm the managing partner of uh, TDWB Farms. We're a, um, a, a combinable crops business um, based in Lichfield, Staffordshire. Uh, it's a business that's expanded rapidly over the last, uh, last kind of 10 years, particularly through that journey to no-till, which has kind of brought us um, a lot of opportunities um, as contract farming opportunities has really expanded the kind of area that we're, that we're kind of covering now. Um, we are, our home farm, the, the 2,000 acre kind of core home farm is, uh, is mostly light, medium soils, low cation exchange, drought prone. And for me, not cost saving, anything like that, my kind of, the reason I came to no-till to start with was, it was all about moisture initially. Uh, I kind of looked at other drought prone areas of the world and looked at what they did to try to use moisture you know, the available rainfall that they got better uh, and the one thing they all had in common is none of them would have ever even considered cultivation because that was just going to lose uh, evaporation and, uh, and, and, and improving infiltration to kind of use the water that we, that we do get better on our soils that don't hold it so well. Uh, so we farm, um, we own land, uh, we have various FBTs but predominantly now contract farming um, has kind of quadrupled the size of the business over the last kind of like uh, uh, seven or eight years now. Uh, nine harvests of, uh, of zero till, this will be our tenth, and previous to that we were min till, so I'm not someone who knows much about ploughing. If you want any ploughing adjustment advice, there's no good asking me, because I once had a go at it when I was about 13 years old and I was pretty rubbish at it, so that's another reason zero till suits me. Um, so why, why did we uh, get here? Why did I kind of like, um, you know, kind of go down this route? It was a, a desire for sustainability. We'd grown into one of those classic farming businesses running you know, the big 600 horsepower fancy tractors that every young boy that grows up on a farm wants to run. And I think once you get to that point, there's nowhere else to go but back down. You know, there's, 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 you, the efficiency seemed to be, well, to be more efficient, actually we need to get smaller. So we've gone from like 600 horsepower tractors to kind of 200 horsepower tractors now, and not many of them. Um, you, also environmentally, you know, it was pretty clear to see that a lot of the ways that we were farming, um, you know, the kind of, you know, lots of use of insecticides and, uh, uh, you know, the lack of diversity and the, the decline you could kind of see in soil health and needing more and more power to achieve the same thing every year. It, it, you could see environmentally that was just heading the wrong way. We, we've now, we are, I think, eight years since I last used an insecticide on the farm and uh, seven years since I last used a dressed seed. So, that those kind of things, have, and that's not because I'm trying to be organic or, or anything, we just, we just don't need them anymore. There's, there's no need for them in our system. Um, soil, the realisation was that actually machinery, labour, all those things, they weren't my resources. My primary resource, my factory floor was the soil. And if we didn't start to give it a bit more respect and try and improve it, um, you know, we were, we were on a hiding to nothing. Certainly, you know, I think having children a few years ago makes you kind of focus on the next generation a little bit and realising that you're only really looking after it, um, you know, and, and not just to run a mining operation rather than a farm, farming operation. I think a lot of farms, through financial pressure, really have, have really, a lot of farms actually are, are running more mining operations than farming operations in, in the last decade or so. Things like FBTs have really not helped with that, that kind of scenario. Um, ag subsidies, um, it's a hot thing now, but you know, it was, it never made, it's never made sense to me. I've never been a fan of being subsidised, uh, but 10 years ago, my business was completely dependent on that subsidy if, to make a profit. Uh, I, if you looked at our accounts back then, our, our profit every year was pretty much the size of our subsidy cheque. So what's the point in actually doing the farming bit in between? Uh, I wanted to create a business that wasn't reliable, reliant on those subsidies, and it was pretty clear to me, they're going to go at some point. 
you know, it's maybe sooner rather than later now, but even 10 years ago to me, it was pretty clear that this wasn't a long-term sustainable kind of situation. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, the expansion we've had, no-till for me has been a, a huge, unique selling point um, for the business. Uh, landowners who are sitting on multi-million pound assets, they, they, if they look at things properly, you know, ultimately, that last few pounds of income from using a one cheaper contractor or a five pound extra for one FBT farmer versus another <clears throat> is not as important as protecting the value of their multi-million pound asset. And the more switched on landowners and estates, they've realized this, they've seen what we're doing with it, they can see it improves their soil uh, and is a sustainable situation and keeps their asset worth what they paid for it or, or you know, what they inherited out or whatever. So it, it's, it's that sustainability and, um, has, has really helped us um, pick up without that race to the bottom competing, just being the cheapest guy in the area and the busiest full contractor. We've not had to do that. I'm unashamedly expensive and I'll sit down and tell any customer that, but we'll do the job well and we'll do it right for them and make sure that their asset is protected. Um, but but this, this is something, um, when I was looking early on, my kind of early travels to America was this whole idea of basically that we don't farm soil, we farm sunlight and water. Uh, those two things, we, we, we basically need to collect as much sunlight, as much water as we can. We're turning that into carbon, and that's what we sell. Uh, or, you know, it, it, it's, it's as simple as that, really, and the focus on that was so the guiding principles of everything I've tried to achieve was then all based around how can I get more sunlight and how can I get more water. So cover cropping, a lot of things that Jake's mentioned, so I won't go into them in detail again, but but basically the cover cropping to make sure that, that solar panel is collecting sunlight as many days of the year as possible. Uh, and an analogy I heard was if you ran a big solar farm, um, you know, would you switch it off in August and September, which is what we all effectively do when we harvest our crops and don't replace them with anything else to capture any sunlight. They're the best yielding sunlight months of the year, so we need to capture that. So cover cropping is an absolute no-brainer, and as Jake says, an, an essential part, in my opinion, of a successful no-till system. Um, but water was a big thing for me, really, as well, so you're yeah, using that. And also this belief that, I think we see this everywhere in nature, healthy soil equals healthy plants. It's as simple as that. And we see it everywhere in nature. The, the, the nature takes out the weak. It's the wildebeest at the back of the pack that the, that the lion will catch. And that means that you know, nature does that, I think, to make sure that the surviving wildebeest grow, you know, evolve to be stronger and fitter and faster all the time. I think it's the same with human beings, it's, and it's the same with plants. Um, a stressed, badly you know, nutritioned plant uh, that's growing in unhealthy soil, I've seen it times over the last few years, is much more, it seems to be much more susceptible, susceptible to disease and pest attack, and then that needs our bags and bottle solution, our quick fixes that we've all got so kind of addicted to, like junkies really, to, to solve those problems for us. So starting with healthy soil, it's giving me healthier plants, then I'm not as reliant on those bags and bottles. These things are all very, you know, any farmer will sit down and moan happily for hours that all these problems that we have, like um, blackgrass, aphids, slugs, even the weather, we, we're all, you know, we're, we're great, farmers are great at moaning about all of these things. Uh, like, they're big problems. I don't believe most of them are problems. I think they're all symptoms of a fundamental problem, which is that soil health has been in decline for the last generation or two of farming. Um, and if we can fix, you know, it's no good kind of fixing symptoms, you need to fix the problem, basically, and that's the fundamental issue that I think we've all got to address in the next, uh, the next generation or two of farmers. Um, so water, going back to water, this is a picture um, actually from this weekend um, and goes back to my primary reason for going down my no-till route. Uh, it was a drone image taken on Sunday and the drone's in one position and it, this is a picture taken of all my neighbour's farm, and it's a bit of a, a naughty thing to do really, um, but he's a very good farmer, in fact there's two farmers land in there, they're very good, very technically able, but they are heavy tillage farmers, they're ploughing and, and deep cultivating. Uh, we've had not a lot of rain recently, and you can see really very clearly what's going on there, the drought stress by Sunday was starting to burn off wheat in, in patches. Now, there's, there's variables here, it's probably different varieties, maybe slightly different drilling dates, because it's a different farm. Um, but he's had the same weather as I've had, and he's got the same soil types as I've got. The drone was then turned 180 degrees to face west um, across our kind of wheat, so pretty much all that in that picture is, is, is all land that we farm. And it's pretty clear to me that that crop is you, that wheat crop is 
utilising that limited amount of water far, far better than, than the next door, those next two farmers. So it's kind of one of the most visual things I think I've kind of had over the years of that it's achieving the aim of utilising water far better. Uh, we're not getting the evaporation, so we're not losing the water, and then we've got much better infiltration through soil structure. So when we do get rainfall, we're actually using every bit of it that, that we can. Um, and putting them side by side, it's, you wouldn't think it was the same, same day, but literally they're drawing, it's just a you know, looking east, looking west, simple as that. So quite a graphic demonstration of how we can use water better, and you know, not a betting man, but I suspect my yields will be a little bit better than next door. Um, right, so the thing is, sometimes we've got too much water. It's not always about, you know, it's access to land, it's, you know, uh, and, and trying to cover large areas. So this was um, quite early, our early days for us in, in Notel. I think it was 2012, which a lot of you might remember as being the, the autumn from hell. It was wet, 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 and never seemed to stop. So we were kind of a year or so in to Notel, it had been going okay. Um, and then we hit across this, this autumn was the first one we'd had when it was really wet and we waited all through September and then October, you know, patiently, it will dry out, it will be fine. By about November, everybody in the area was chaining tractors together and pulling to pull a four for a plough up the field and power harrowing and making a right mess. This was a cover crop we'd put in that year after, after, um, after an all sea rape crop. So it had loads of time to grow because we'd been delayed with the drilling. So it had kind of, you know, and that's, this is the kind of amount of growth you can get. It was kind of, you know, four foot tall by the time we got to early November. And believe it or not, this soil is, when we were doing this, really wet, really nasty conditions. A couple of fields away, they were struggling to plough. Um, and if I can skip through this just quickly, these, it's kind of visiting this field back through the, the kind of, so that was kind of a drilling. Um, this is the crop just starting to emerge. Um, we glyphosated, obviously, after, you know, kind of a week or so after, after drilling as late as we dared. Um, so that's kind of by about January kind of time, like early, early kind of spring. Um, it was good on the headlands. At, at the same point, people were now ripping up those crops that they'd tried to daub in with power harrows and ploughs because it really hadn't got anywhere. Uh, and that was it, come before its first kind of nitrogen application, kind of, you know, early March kind of time. And it ended up just being a perfectly normal wheat crop that looks like anybody else's. And again, this was one of those epiphanous moments for me that, that this was a technique that could help in lots of ways. It was giving me the ability to have longer access windows to the, to the ground. The, the soil was carrying machinery better um, and, and, uh, and able to kind of like, you know, the growing cover crop was sucking moisture out of it, as well as capturing that sunlight. So the whole thing was starting to come together for me that as a total system, there's lots of advantages, really, that, uh, that, that it was beginning to bring. So that was quite early days in 2012. It's, it's those kind of things and those little successes, those little wins that, that keep pushing you to kind of push things further and experiment more with companion crops and, and relay cropping and lots of other stuff that, we, that we've kind of done since then. Um, just briefly on equipment. Um, I wanted to make the point, it doesn't have to be expensive. So we run two drills now. Um, we run a, 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 a larger version of that 750A that we first started with. Um, we've had to modify it quite extensively to kind of make it fit things. I'm a, I'm a big believer on a lot of crops of using some seedbed fertilizer. Um, so, you know, it, there's been an evolution of having to kind of not be scared to jump in the workshop and take a plasma cutter to a new machine and that kind of thing to, to kind of um, to, to make it what it needs to be. Um, and, you know, you can go out and, s a lot of people say the barrier to, to, to no-till is, oh, it's, it's okay for kind of large farming businesses like Jake's or, or my own or whatever, but, you know, the, the barrier is having to go and spend hundreds of thousands of pounds on re-equipping your farm to, to make it work. Um, when we needed some extra capacity, we, uh, I, I kind of almost try. I purposely set out to see how cheaply I could get another no-till drill working on the farm. So we bought um, uh, an old... Um, minimum tillage drill uh, from Eastern Europe, this, this horse, I it, it brought this over, and set about like a kind of a low disturbance conversion on it. The entire thing cost me 10,000 pounds, and it doubled our capacity. So it just goes to show, I think, with this drill particularly, that you don't need to spend fortunes. Uh, it can do a very similar to job to, the, to that kind of, you know, 80,000 pounds John Deere. Um, but, um, and the two working together, the combination of a tine drill and a disc drill in a system, really does give you the best of both worlds. It's a, it's, a, it's a debate that's often talked about what's best, tines or discs. My opinion is you're best to have both. 
because the situations where a disc is the right thing, the situations where a tie is the right thing, but um, by having the option of either, you can kind of mix and match between the two for the right agronomic situation. Um, but both those drills have that one key aim. Um, yeah, like Jake's drill again, it's all about minimal soil disturbance. We're trying to kind of keep the previous crop residue as intact as possible. Uh, and just, just do the bare minimum we need to to get a seed into there and growing, maintaining and preserving that moisture, uh, keeping that soil armour uh, and, and not disturbing all that biology and, uh, and, and kind of structure that we've built uh, through, through that not disturbance. So, um, Just briefly, yields wise, we, we say we're, we're not generally on the heaviest end, so you'll never find me in Farmers Weekly boasting about my 15 tonnes of the hectare wheat crop that's broken some world record or whatever. Um, but uh, what we found is the first side, what we found is that our average is basically, we're kind of, this isn't about, this isn't a low input, low output system is the point I want to get across. I've always been chasing yield, maximum output. Um, you know, kind of out output is king to, in most businesses. You, you need that output. So I've, I've never accepted this idea that, well, yeah, okay, we're spending less, we're less, less going on, um, so therefore we can afford less output. I push for more output all the time and we'll use every technique I can that will get me that. So our average yield has gone on milling wheats from eight and a half. Uh, we're, we're all milling wheat. Like Jake, we're always trying to grow for a premium or a specific market and maximise that kind of, uh, any kind of premiums available. So all our wheat is milling wheat. Um, we've gone from eight and a half tonnes per hectare to a 9.1 average. But I think interestingly, it's the, the, lows, the lows under the old kind of um, mint till type system there versus the, the zero till over there. Uh, are the lows aren't as low but the highs are that bit higher and that's where the average is coming from it's more consistent i think is a thing that's what's it's where where the average is coming from more a bit more consistency uh, it's a similar story with ray um basically so just i've used that slide really just because it, i don't a lot of people do accommodate from that whole well yeah you're doing less it's a kind of a you know that kind of semi-organic type system so you're going to accept less output well no that's that's not the case um other measurements over the years, that really, it's, it's just the changes in soil, the physical changes in soil. I think it's a great skill that my generation has lost in farming, and my grandfather would have probably laughed at, which is just the, abil the ability to assess soil just by digging a hole, you know, picking it up, feeling texture of it, smelling it. Sounds a bit crazy, but all those kind of things, really, is, is, is we've got over-technical, I think, in recent years, and we've relied on, you know, kind of black and white, quantifiable samples. And I think what we've got to get back a little bit, and what I've certainly been learning to do in the last few years, is to farm a little bit on gut feel and what seems right. And it seems to work. So, you know, all that together. So uh, that's pretty much all I've got slide-wise. Um, but uh, really, it's a... Uh, Paul, if you want any questions or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Well, if, um, you know, talk about light bulb moments, we're running out of light bulbs and, and um, the show isn't an hour long. Um, there's a, any questions, there's a roving mic, so wait till the mic gets to you. I'll, I'll point at you and Camilla will come along. Um, say who you are, don't be shy, and um, any hands up or maybe there's no question? Oh, here we go, yeah. Do you guys want to come up? Yeah, uh, question for Jake. Uh, my name's Charles Hunter Smart, an organic farmer from uh, Oxfordshire. Jake, uh, you mentioned that you were wanting to put uh, 3,000 tons of organic matter back into your farm. How did you arrive at that figure? Um, not particularly scientific, other than I took five tonnes a hectare of what I'd like to apply every year to get my base nutrients right, depending on the product, um, sort of for P and K elements, that sort of stuff, and just multiplied that up by, by the area, so nothing more scientific than that. Just to give me a ballpark figure of how much do I need to source in, where can I fit that in the rotation? Uh, Ralph Day, uh, farmer in Link North Lincolnshire. Uh, the last speaker suggested we should have a disc and a time drill for particular situations. Could you just uh, elucidate on, on that uh, comment, please? Um, yeah, I, I think it's a big ask to, to try and find a single machine that can be, you know, kind of jack of all trades. Um, the situation, a disc drill is 
the right thing to use. If you're drilling into those big, tall cover crops, there's the mechanical issue of just physically block a, 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 you know, a, a, a time drill will just act like a big rake in a lot of cases. So physically, it just can't cope with those kind of conditions. Um, however, a disc drill in a white, so uh, after, after a, a heavy chopped wheat crop straw, for instance, or uh, if you're putting wheat in after oats, those kind of situations, hairpinning of the straw can be a big issue. So the, the crop residue in the slot with the seed uh, combined with kind of the wrong conditions like kind of a prolonged wet or cooler type spell can really end up destroying or, or doing for the crop. So in those kind of situations, a time drill is preferable. Now, there's, there's various drills that kind of, you know, try to combine best of both. Personally, I thought rather than trying to do that, when I could add a time drill to my system so cheaply, um, it just made more sense to have both those options. There is issues with scale, I guess. I mean, you know, for kind of a, for, if you're farming for smaller acreages to start justifying several drills. But in perspective, I have so little other equipment. Um, we don't have yards full of equipment or my entire um, you know, machinery fleet fits in a, you know, in, in one relatively small shed. So you can kind of afford that luxury of more than one drill. We've all been, been used to in previous systems having one drill that kind of does all crops. But I think the truth is there's different things are better suited to different situations. Hi, oh, yeah. um, Andy Rumming, uh, livestock farmer and uh, part-time worker for the Rural Payments Agency. Um, how do you think the government should uh, assist and help farmers uh, sort of transfer into uh, no-till systems? Do you think that's through uh, help on capital expenditure, or do you think there's other ways, or do you think they should stay out of it altogether? Uh, uh, interesting question, really. Uh, I'm not a politician or a policymaker, so... Uh, um, I think one thing that is con consistently annoying is that capi the capital um, schemes I don't think work so well because they tend to penalise innovators. People have been doing this for kind of, uh, you know, 10 years or so, like, like myself. We kind of miss out on all that stuff. So where's the incentive to innovate and try new techniques and whatever if, if by being kind of, you know, kind of pushing these ideas forward, you end up completely ineligible. I've never been able to claim any grant for anything in the entire time I've been farming. Um, not that there's not grants about, they just have never fitted our, our situation. I think one of the ways that, um, that it could, the government could help or the system could help is in the transition period. I think the hardest thing to do in no-till no is transition from where you are today as a tillage farmer to uh, that no-till situation. Because before you start to restore that balance of beneficial insects and whatever, you've still got an issue with you know, aphids that could take out a whole crop. So you're taking a bit of a risk. Now, maybe I just got lucky in the three years and happened to do it at the right time, where we had three decent seasons to do it. You know, there was losses along the way. And I think probably the danger is when someone has that kind of, you know, when it doesn't work, that first time they kind of have a crop that doesn't do so well, the inclination is to just kind of throw the baby out of the bathwater and say, right, oh, it doesn't work, get the plough back out, we can't afford to do this because we need to pay the bills at Tesco's this week or whatever. So um, I think probably government can probably help most by helping that transition period uh, and almost offering some kind of some base in it that says, look, you know, if you have those failures or in those early years or whatever, we'll, we'll put in like a, a safety net to get you through that painful barrier. That, that might work. Um, but, but I'm not a great fan in subsidies anyway. I think they, they distort markets. So I would rather be a grown up and kind of run a proper business that fends for itself, really. Um, and that's not, not what everybody wants and not popular with all farmers, but, but uh, we're running businesses and we need to run them like businesses and kind of, you know, fend for ourselves a little bit. And if, it, if it's not economic, it's not economic, is it? <laughs> Yeah, can I, can I just add to that? I totally agree with where Clive's coming from in terms of the capital grant stuff. I mean, there was one, a small productivity grant act not so long ago. You could get a no-till drill on there um, if you didn't have, or you had to have bank markers on it and things like this. It was really, really specific stuff. Um, the transition is really difficult, and you do lose crops along the way. Uh, we've lost some linseed this year um, through flax beetle and bits and pieces. Soul destroying, because you don't want to use an insecticide, um, and yet your crop is there just being chewed away. So I think the other thing the government can help us on is research um, and actually getting that knowledge exchange out to farmers. Um, the research isn't going to be done by chemical companies particularly or fertiliser companies or machinery manufacturers. So I think there's a real knowledge gap there 
for long-term products and that project, and that's something maybe for the AHDB to have a look at. Not look at min-till versus ploughing, look at direct drilling, look at proper no-till. NIAB have done a STAR project and they've done that with min-till. So again, that, it is a different kettle of fish completely to no-till. Um, and that is, however you describe no-till versus min-till, it, it is very, very different. And that year-on-year -year experimental evidence is something that I think government needs to step in and do. I think, um, yes, if I could just add to the, uh, that, at the moment there's no, there is no standard measurement for soil health. We're all talking about, you know, uh, Americans particularly like to talk about uh, percentage improvement in, in um, soil organic matter, but very hard to, to find a standard measurement for that. Michael Gove's talking about rewarding us for looking after our soil, talking about soil health an awful lot, which is fantastic, but how is that going to be measured and how is that, you know, what is the future for that? So, so um, uh, there's a question over there. Yep, John Hawkins, arable farmer. Uh, my uncle was a no-teller in the 70s. I've just started no-telling again. Why are you persisting with growing the same crops that uh, everyone seems to have always grown? So all of the speakers keep growing milling wheat, keep growing malting barley, keep growing all seed rape, which is an interesting one that I've given up. Why, if you're doing such a good job with your cover crops, are you not trying to find new markets with new crops when you've got the likes of Ukraine, who can grow wheat cheaper than you, um, Brazil, who can grow soya cheaper than you can. Isn't it a time, if you're going to lead the way on the machinery side, the practical side, perhaps you need to find new markets with the crops you're growing and maybe start using the crops we currently grow as cash crops, as cover crops, because they're so valueless, and perhaps some of the beans and other things that you're growing and trashing into the ground could become the cash crops. What do you think? Uh, it's not through want of not trying. I mean, I've, I've, I've grown and still grow a lot of different crops. Um, wheat, it's a gross margin thing, isn't it? You, you can't beat the gross margin of a wheat and a rape crop. However, we can't, no-till doesn't work if you stick with those kind of traditional rotations. So number one important thing in any no-till system is rotation, and it has to change significantly. Um, but over the last few years, we've grown we grow wheat, obviously, rape, um, linseed, lupins, soya, uh, spring oats, uh, winter beans, spring beans. Um, I'm forgetting stuff, I'm sure. Linseed, have I got that in there? Uh, um, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a lot more diversity going on. The trouble is, oh, millet, another one, uh, canary seed. Uh, there's, there's lots of different things that we've grown. So we're getting that extra diversity. It's a much more diverse rotation. But the gross margins in those crops are all poor relations to wheat and rape, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, we've gone away from, in my old mintil system, rape would have been grown kind of one in three. It was that wheat, wheat, rape type rotation, which isn't really a rotation. It's just about gross margins, isn't it? Um, we're now on, our rape is now kind of, you know, only kind of 10% of our, of our area, and it's a kind of a one in seven type crop. As a result, our rape is a lot better than it was years ago, so the gross margin's good on it. Uh, so it, it's, it's economics, it's, it's, uh, at the end of the day we've, we've got to, we're still, I, particularly in my case, as a contract, you know, a contract, to contract farmer, um, my customers want a bottom line, uh, they're not doing it for fun and I have to justify what we're doing to them all the time you know, to, to do it, so that's the answer really from me. Yeah, I mean, I haven't got much more to add than that, other than we've been growing some buckwheat and vetches and bits and pieces, um, and there's hodmadods and people like that that are having some really good ideas in terms of pulses. I think pulses are something that's really undervalued as a protein source in the country. Um, it's, they're really hard to get a margin out of those in the west of the country where we are. Um, we're in our third year of peas. We've stopped doing spring beans. Can't get them going. You need to use insecticides some years. We haven't on peas this year. Um, so it's that, Clive's right, it's that economic return, the gross margin, um, coupled with the marketing skills and the time that we have to actually go out there and set something new up. But I think that's also where there could be some, you know, going back to the gentleman's question there with the, with, um, with, with the government funding as to whether or not there's some kind of marketing issues and, and ideas and schemes that we can put together to collect like a no-till, nutrient-dense loaf of bread or something like that. But it is challenging. Lionel Shaw, a farmer, um, South Bedfordshire. Uh, just two things. One thing, 
was the first is a comment uh, about learning about uh, direct drilling and that side of things. I'd really um, like to promote the idea of joining the base group because you'll then share with lots of other direct drillers their information and that in the two years that I've belonged to that group it's made a huge difference and so that, that, that's the one side of it. The other one is you've talked about companion crops and cover crops. What about a permanent cover? So a lot of the French are now using white clover in the bottom of the crop and leaving it there permanently. Have either of you experimented with that? Yeah, we've experimented on two occasions. Um, one, we came out of a grass lay, um, well, predominantly white clover, sprayed it off, the clover didn't die. So I thought, okay, we'll just leave it there. And it survived for about three different crops. And we then did some reduced rate nitrogen in the following wheat, went into spring barley the next year. And by the time the end of the spring barley had come, it sort of kind of died out, really got competed out. Um, it's something that I think we need to keep exploring. And I think with oilseed rate, that's, that could be an opportunity to, um, to get that established in, in that season and try and keep it going through the wheat. Uh, where it fits in nicely, I think, in the future is where we're grazing stock. So my idea was to have it bumbling along in the bottom of the wheat, combine the wheat off, and then you've got some, um, some white clover for flushing ewes on or for finishing lambs on. So it's something we're playing around. We've got it this year in some uh, undersown uh, leafy turnips, these sort of graze and come again turnips. Um, and we'll see how it goes. If we can keep that on into the following wheat crop, then we'll try. But in, in terms of um, kind of getting a second crop, if you like, off those fields, then it's something we need to try and learn a little bit more about, try and keep it in the ground for longer. Uh, Lionel, you mentioned um uh, social media and talking to other farmers. Uh, Clive actually runs a thing called the Farming Forum, which is Europe-wide farmers talking to each other, sharing, learning, and um, he's very shy, so he didn't mention it, but um, uh, it is absolutely your best friend if you want to, if you want to sort of branch out, do, some, do something different and, and um, consult other farmers. And, and then my brother John is on it the whole time. It's always, it, it, it encourages you to experiment and try other things. And, and if you think you're having a bad time, there's always somebody worse off. That's always got a useful thing as well. So. <laughs> Did either of you want to say anything? Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, first of all, yeah, dead right. I mean, the reason I started the farming forum was because when I was kind of starting out on this journey a little bit, I kind of realized that I needed to learn to farm again. And I was too old to go back to college, so I needed to learn from other farmers already doing it. There was some already doing it in the UK. There's a lot more in other parts of the world. You know, Europe seemed to be a bit ahead. Denmark, Sweden, there's some really good guys there, a lot of experience. And the best way um, to kind of do that was to, I kind of created it really quite selfishly to, so I'd got this platform where I could pick everybody else's brains. Um, but knowledge transfer is, is essential. Uh, Jake mentioned it earlier. A lot of the things that are going on with no-till, they're not very commercial. They're not in anyone's interest. So the research, isn't being done, or if the research is being done, it's perhaps sometimes coming with answers that people with products to sell don't necessarily want to tell us about because it's telling us use less, do less. That doesn't sell more tractors, doesn't sell more machinery, doesn't sell more bags and bottles. So fundamentally, this is a real case of if as farmers we don't kind of lead this and do it for ourselves, you know, the commercial world that we've been so dependent on for that kind of information in the last kind of you know 50 years or so, then they're not they're not going to help or invest in kind of you know, reducing their, their turnovers for us. So that is essential. And um, I mean, off the back of that, we've, we've done, we've just started um, a bit of a kind of thing I wanted to do for a long time. Um, we've just published in our magazine called uh, Direct Driller, which second edition, it's an issue, it's just printed. Um, and again, that again, the aim of that is to try to create a slightly more, you know, um, a broadsheet Type, uh, um, rather than tabloid type agricultural publication, something that kind of tries to bring some of the research that's out there, uh, it, you know, and put it in front of farmers. So, you know, a, a, an economist Lancet type publication for farming, I think there's a real gap for that to be around at the moment and, and not be, you know, kind of driven commercially by that advertising revenue to actually be something that is worth us all reading uh, and not just a heap of advertorial and that, and that kind of thing. So I think that's quite important that that needs to exist because the internet's not for everybody. Um, 
going back to your crop, the, the question that was about the, the, the kind of understories of different crops and whatever, it really is, it's the next step to be honest, and it's something I've been really researching in the last kind of 12 months and actively looking at. I think where I'm at the moment when I'm thinking with that is, I think the answer may actually not necessarily to be to try to kind of grow the, the you know, so things like clover in the, in, in the bottom of these crops, but maybe to kind of go to like a strip type situation. Um, I've come across people in other countries where they're using, say, clover, you know, strips of clover, and then planting the wheat between them in a kind of a strip kind of type situ situation. Uh, and, then, and then they're able to kind of, because the issue is, as Jake touched on, it's, it's, it's trying to still be able to use herbicides um, without taking out the other crop, because there's, there's, there's lots of complicated agronomic issues to consider. Um, but by farming almost in a strip type situation, we could almost in the same field have those crops growing together and then say that the, the following year you could grow and put the next crop into a strip where the clover was for instance and you built that fertility and, and swap between the two but it, it's really interesting and I think it's the next step for this. I don't think, I don't think the system I've evolved is anywhere near its, 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 its kind of final kind of form. It's going to continue to evolve hopefully as much as it has over the last 10 years.